Good afternoon from Singapore and also a big hello to all our friends tuning in from all around the world. Thank you and welcome to today's session where we'll be talking about AI and ethics in aviation. My name is Wimin from SG Innovate and for those who may know, SG Innovate is a government-backed deep tech investor and company builder whose mission is to help entrepreneurial scientists build deep tech startups that are looking to solve big global problems. Our work also involves building a global community of leaders, thinkers, and doers to drive and scale up deep tech innovations in areas such as AI, healthcare, quantum tech, and autonomous technology across various industries. For today's webinar, we have two guest speakers with us, Mr. Michael Daniel, Managing Director of Aviation Insight, and Mr. Vicky Bangu, President, Southeast Asia, Pacific, and South Korea from Rose Price. They will each be giving a keynote presentation on a topic before going into a discussion segment to be moderated by Professor Mark Finlay, Professoral Research Fellow and Director at SMU Center for AI and Data Governance. We encourage for all attendees to share with us your thoughts on the topic or to interact with our speakers by posting your questions in the Q&A tab located at the bottom panel of your screen. Otherwise, feel free to just say hi and do a quick shout out from where you are in the chat box below. With no further ado, do allow me to invite Mr. Xia King Yo, Chief Executive of Association of Aerospace Industries Singapore, for opening remarks as well. Mr. Xia, please. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Xia, and on behalf of the Association of Aerospace Industries Singapore, it's my pleasure to welcome you to this webinar. AAIS is a not for profit corporate membership organization representing the aerospace industry in Singapore. We recently looked at the subject of AI applications in aerospace, and today's webinar is a perfect complement for the sessions that we had. Uh, I'm really looking forward to a rich and engaging discussion today. Our first speaker is uh, Mr. Michael Daniel, an internationally recognized expert in civil aviation safety and regulatory oversight. Uh, he is the Managing Director of Aviation Insight, and a member of AAIS panel of experts. Welcome, Mike, and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, uh, Ken Yok, and thank you for the uh, introduction. So let me go to uh, Zoom share screen and begin to my presentation. And let's see, just one second as I get. Okay, you, you should be able to see the uh, presentation on your screens now. So uh, thank you very much for the invitation to be- uh, 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 Mike, sorry, yes. I think you may need to adjust your display settings uh, on the top to full screen instead. Oh, okay, just one second. We'll go this way. Yep, that is great. Okay, very good, thank you. Okay, because um, when you're dealing with different uh, monitors, you know, you're going to be uh, faced with different challenges here. So, but anyway, what I was saying is uh, thank you for the invitation. It's a very uh, nice privilege to be uh, giving this uh, webinar, especially with esteemed uh, colleagues and, and uh, experts uh, <clears throat> that will be with you today. Uh, today, I will give you somewhat a, more of a regulator perspective, uh, since most of my uh, work career has been in the regulatory uh, field as well as accident investigation. So losing, uh, if you recall from the events uh, display or the, uh, uh, the events where uh, <clears throat> describing what this session is all about, you'll see that there are four questions that were raised by EASA, the European uh, Euro Aviation Safety Agency. And uh, one of the questions would be how to establish public trust in AI-based systems and how to integrate the ethical dimension of AI, transparency, non-discrimination. But I'll be focusing a bit more on the technical side, uh, how to prepare the certification of AI systems, and then what standard protocols and methods we'll need to develop to ensure that we'll be using AI properly to what? Improve aviation safety. But when you have the questions, we have to think of the thought, why? Why, why are we concerned or why do we need to discuss the ethical uh, component or perspective of artificial intelligence? The why it comes from, because it's controversial now, uh, that the uh, adoption of AI technology especially into the design and development and certification of our safety systems, 
it's we're not really there on a uh, um, standardized basis or a harmonized basis. Uh, still a little bit uh, around uh, the map a little bit, if you will. Uh, in particular, you know, stopping, uh, starting from the top down, from the International Civil Aviation Organization down to the regulator bodies. And I'll explain why uh, here in a minute. But the, the controversy of AI uh, can also come from the, the heightened concern of safety concerns with regard of implementing our artificial intelligence, the pros and cons. And so anytime we have a certain a level of uncertainty, then you're gonna have some uh, controversy and also some concerns. So should we be afraid of artificial intelligence? Well, uh, it depends on how you implement it, isn't it? I mean, if you concern uh, about the safety part, part of it and the public trust, then we should be able to fully embrace artificial intelligence to use those technologies to advance the cause of aviation safety. Um, so this is this is you know really what we're striving for with regard to aviation uh, safety and artificial intelligence. Okay, but what could possibly go wrong? So I just have a couple of slides on uh, science fiction, uh, some movies and novels that were given a few decades ago, which also kind of generated a public angst and bias towards artificial intelligence. What could possibly go wrong? If you recall from the, the novel or movie, uh, the, uh, 2001 Space Odyssey, the, 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 say the advocate of, the, uh, of the, the, the movie was actually AI, a computer and program called HAL 9000. But the, what I like about science fiction and these particular movies I'll, I'll talk about just for a second, is they actually bring in some factual information that we use today. In this case, uh, how do we program computers using the human element? And uh, so how uh, 9000 was the, uh, um, uh, the, the, the main concern. If you know this movie, I do recommend. I do have a Wikipedia link uh, in the presentation. You can look at it later if you choose to. Another one is uh, the Terminator series. So here you have a neural network with multiple layers. You have, uh, the, let's say, the, what could go along with the human aspect in design into artificial intelligence where the actual programs take over. They take control of the human. So that is also one of the concerns about we as humans and, and with regard to artificial intelligence. Uh, another movie was War Games. Uh, what I like about this particular science fiction was that it tells us that uh, artificial intelligence can also be a means of computers correcting themselves or modifying their behavior, learning from previous mistakes or uh, variables. So that's another uh, nice thing about science fiction. It does kind of bring us out of our general thinking uh, envelope to where we think beyond and using those uh, those aspects into what we would want to do today. Okay, but getting into the, the reality now, and uh, this, uh, this particular slide here shows that uh, there's a game show uh, called Jeopardy. And uh, in 2011, the, the TV series uh, worked with IBM um, and IBM developed a computer and, and system called Watson. Now, the challenge here was to using artificial intelligence, using probability of trying to decide what the right question is for the answer. And it was proven in this series of the challenge of machine versus human, the machine won. And it's, it's quite interesting. Uh, I'm, I'm sure there's some uh, videos of these uh, uh, Jeopardy, Jeopardy challenges. But the point is, is that, you know, here we have the use of probability and the algorithms, whereas the machine did beat the human uh, component in these challenging uh, TV series. And it's a very good, uh, good uh, program to watch. There's also something that I'd uh, like to mention too, that Watson developed by IBM is also has its own research team working on to adapt uh, information intensive fields uh, into telecommunications, financial services and government. So that's interesting, right? Including government as part of a research firm uh, for artificial intelligence. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit more into the aviation field, starting with the International Civil Aviation Organization, the top layer, if you will, 
that develops the standards and recommended practices for all of us in, in the aviation field. And then I will talk a little bit about uh, what a couple of the regulators are doing, primarily EASA and FAA, with regard to artificial intelligence. Okay, starting uh, back uh, with ICAO, the International Civilization Organization, there's a list of five goals, I'm sorry, six goals, that are mentioned in the Global Aviation Safety Plan. And all these reference documents are provided at the end of my presentation, so you can continue your own, your own reading and research, if you will, if you want to start looking at the aviation components and, and how it's approached that way. But uh, let's go down to the goal five and goal number six of the Aviation Safety Plan, where ICAO wants to develop the use and expand the use of industry programs. So we need to rely more so on industry, ever more so, because it's the industry that's leading the technology. It's the industry that's actually leading us into the standards used in technology, uh, but those are approved by the regulators. So uh, ICAO recognizes that the importance of industry, industry contribution. Okay, um, there was a significant working paper that was presented at uh, one of the General Assemblies uh, not too long ago. This, in this case, it was January of 2019, where the General Assembly specifically talked about artificial intelligence and digital, digital, digitalization and aviation. So in this document, you will see that there's not really a single accepted definition of what artificial intelligence is. We do have different definitions, different, uh, um, let's say, perceptions of artificial intelligence. But from the aviation side, it's not really uh, officially adopted as a terms of reference. So, But uh, in general, though, AI considered, though, is the raw computing power of machines, the cognitive power to think, learn, and make decisions. And in the context of this uh, paper, it talks about using various technologies and functionalities, including machine learning, deep learning, artificial neural networks, and the knowledge-based reasoning as part of a baseline or group thinking for how we can approach artificial intelligence. Okay. Um, then there's, this is very important uh, to keep in mind that we as the state representing all the airlines, all of the pilots, all the airmen involved in aviation, that we have to use what we call safety management systems. And I put a couple of reference documents on, on the screen here, because whatever we do in aviation, we have to consider the, the hazards of, uh, the, that are introduced in aviation, including hazards of computer software, as well as the risk management. And so as a reference document, we have an ICAO annex specifically for safety management systems, as well as a uh, manual, the, it's document 9859, the safety management manual. So again, for reference purposes, I encourage you to look at these documents. They're free and open to the public. You can just use a search engine to, to find them to understand the aviation approach to safety systems and risk management. Okay, uh, swinging over uh, from ICAO, the overarching organization for global aviation, now to talk a little bit more about what uh, specifically some of the regulators are doing. So in IASA, IASA the European Aviation Safety Agency, they recently announced a uh, tender for understanding, better understanding machine learning. So that was announced by EASA and they're looking for uh, papers and academia experts to contribute to that. And there's a timeline for that in November, 2000, uh, November 4th, 2021. But there's also the EASA roadmap for artificial intelligence. So I give kudos to EASA and EU for thinking about this to put it more, let's say in a, a programmatic fashion to really focus on artificial intelligence as part of aviation safety. And so when we talk about a framework of what we can use for uh, artificial intelligence or ethics, uh, if you will, for, uh, for us and, and the regulators, uh, the, the EU does give us some ethical guidelines. And I think you'll hear more about this in the next presenter uh, with regard to how industry and a company can use these guidelines for, 
artificial intelligence ethics. But including uh, you know, guidelines, things such as uh, accountability, uh, the oversight, privacy is a big issue, and data governance. We're just dealing with massive amounts of data with regard to artificial intelligence. So how do we, how do we treat that? How do we deal with that? Um, Non-discrimination and fairness, transparency, the societal and environmental well-being. So that is not necessarily technical issues for us in aviation, but it's more of, you know, the, let's say the soft skills of what we need in aviation safety, ethically speaking, for the development of artificial intelligence and to therefore be trustworthy enough, transparent enough for acceptance by the general public when we're flying in aviation. Okay, on the FAA side, the United States side, uh, they've been looking at uh, artificial intelligence actually for a number of years now. They do have uh, uh, several committees. The FAA is a very large organization. There's 47,000 people in the FAA. Uh, most of them are in air traffic. So they've got a lot of resources to vote to devote into developing uh, industry standards, regulator, uh, regulatory standards for us and, and the United States side. Uh, so just to mention that there is a program called NextGen. They do have research priorities. They published a document in October 2019, which tackles the issues about automation and the human interface of automation in the aviation system. But more specifically, and this is even going back even further in time, there's a, a report that was provided uh, to the FAA, it's called the Verification of Adaptive Systems, Adaptive Systems, Artificial Intelligence. So it's a very good document because they talk about even uh, how could someone approach AI, but, it's, but if you read the document, you'll see it's more of a technical document as opposed to including now more of the ethical components that ESA recently surfaced in, in, their, in their concern doc documents. Okay, so, uh, you know, when we're sharing information, again, we have masses amount of data to, to work with and, and how machines learn from that data, drive that data. We do have things uh, called the CPDLC, that's a digital uh, discussion between the airline or the airplane cockpit, the flight deck and air traffic control. So we, that's been there for many years, the digital discussion, but what isn't there are some of the decision-making processes. So when we introduce artificial intelligence, that may take out the human interface altogether and just rely mainly on uh, aircraft and air traffic communication and therefore judgment uh, decision-making. So um, also uh, in going back to the committees and discussion, again, they talk about the privacy, uh, uh, social media, which is interesting, how does social media uh, use their algorithms for human behavior. Um, so it's, it's very controversial, but yet, uh, you know, that's, that's something they have to consider as what is the, you know, the big tech companies using for, in, in this case, uh, social media to learn from those experiences and with regard to artificial intelligence. Um, I uh, have another bullet here, now getting into the more technical aspect of artificial intelligence using the imagination, using the technology of how we can use AI to further aviation safety. And uh, so there's been discussions of using things like non-destructive testing from an artificial intelligence perspective to make the right decisions based on the data that it receives and not necessarily relying on human decision-making uh, because there have been some serious accidents based on human decision-making if you take it from, a, let's say, a factual context point of view, maybe we can get around that. This would be a good benefit or a great benefit of using artificial intelligence on a technical perspective. Uh, the integrity of continuing your wordness, more relying on factual data. Um, and, and then those other considerations too, you know, from audit perspective, uh, in artificial intelligence, do you have uh, things like computers auditing other computers? You have to think about things like that. It just, just takes it to a whole new dimension with regard to the use of artificial intelligence. Uh, and then last bullet, uh, one of the discussion points recently was the use of autopilots. Autopilots used to be uh, sensor driven for the aircraft, but now with uh, computer driven autopilots, that's a different dimension. 
And it also introducing, uh, introduces some hazards and, and potential risk from cyber hack attacks or cyber attacks. And that is a very big concern. Okay, um, this uh, slide here gives us the certification regulatory framework for everything we do for design, testing, and certification with regard to aircraft uh, certification. So uh, the FAA and the ESA model, most airworthiness, I'm sorry, most regulators use this model of regulation part 21. It gives us the regulations for design approval, uh, production approval, uh, within that testing uh, procedures. So just to bring out that all of this it has been done, been dealt with for decades. So, but how do we adapt it today for uh, digital uh, and computer science, artificial intelligence? Uh, because we have to, because again, industry is leading us in terms of technology. So we have to be somewhat flexible on the regulatory side for approving those systems for aviation safety. Uh, just a comment about how the regulators issue a type design uh, and a type design certificate for each aircraft that is built and manufactured. So there are design standards already out there and they do have to include uh, computers and uh, software and hardware. So that's there already, but is there an ethical uh, component of that? Mm, not yet, not yet. And then uh, just a just quick, quick mention that there are airworthiness standards. Again, what are those airworthiness standards in play for aviation safety, for, for what we use for the type design, for uh, computer uh, programming, uh, the software and hardware. Okay, now this is where it will get interesting because uh, these regulations have been out for, for a few decades and including EASA, you know, being the more recent uh, major regulator, but yes, FAA, they follow basically the same processes for design and production. But uh, what I wanted to point out is that there's a there's a kind of a catch-all. There's a there's a provision in regulations called special conditions, and they're issued by both EASA and the FAA to deal with unique or novel or or new characteristic design features. And this is where you have to bring uh, experts together in order to to give a standard for design, testing, and certification. Okay, um, the, uh, for the avionics portion, which is uh, heavily revol uh, involved with uh, computer programming and software. So there are organizational requirements. Again, it's not up to the standards of where we would talk about ethical practices, uh, they're, they're not there. This is purely technical requirements, and that's where we're at. That's the current state in aviation for all authorities. Okay, we have uh, regulations for the issuance and responsibility of the holder, just to mention that anybody who designs and produces uh, aviation components, avionics, software, you have to go through a certification process in order to prove out the safety and airworthiness. Now, mind you, uh, some of these uh, design standards are in the order of 10 to the minus, minus uh, ninth in terms of reliability and uh, and maybe in some cases even even more uh, precise. So it can get pretty pretty restrictive uh, with regard to to proving out a system. Okay, um, there. Speaking of industry, so there is an industry uh, group called RTCA. Both uh, the FAA and ESA is heavily reliant on RTCA for helping develop industry standards for not only hardware in this case, as you see in your screen, but also for software. So if you if you look at the Moore's law, I believe is that when you look at the the advancement of the, the hardware, if you will, and the number of transistors doubles nearly every two years. And so now you're getting into the uh, nanotechnology of the hardware, uh, it, as mentioned, and I think in one of the previous videos, it's not even digital anymore, it's something else. You're getting into the nano molecular level of design and production. And it's quite amazing what's happening there. So, um, so that has, that's important because it's the hardware which will enable the software, right? So you have to look at it from both perspectives, the hardware as well as the software. 
And then the other uh, reference document specifically for uh, aviation software development, um, the uh, RTCA document, DO 178, it's quite uh, famous worldwide. Uh, it, you have uh, RTCA and industry experts coming together to, to bring out these industry standards that can be used by the regulators in order to approve systems and, and also the safety aspect of production. Okay. There are other additional rules that are required by the regulator. In this case, I'm citing the equipment systems and installation. So what I wanna say about this is that no matter what you design, and you have to, you have to certify it, you have to do that through a regimen of testing. And, uh, and, and it's very, uh, let's say a little bit more tricky with uh, software these days uh, with regard to how do you really prove out the safety and airworthiness of algorithms. And that requires a lot more thought and, and uh, discussion with regard to those testing standards. Going back to the earlier slide of special conditions, and this is where you see special conditions creep in to the certification processes. Okay, uh, some safety challenges and constraints. Uh, there's another industry report out there. This one is from SAE International. It came out not too long ago, uh, April of 2021, where they specifically talk about artificial intelligence and aeronautical systems and the statements of concerns. It's a very good document to bring out what, what industry feels would be the gap between where we're at today in, in digital and computer science as a, and artificial intelligence as to what the regulators are using. So they do identify some of those gaps and it's a very good document. They talk, you know, they do talk about, um, you know, safety critical airborne systems and machine learning. So again, it's just another good reference document. Okay, um, so I mentioned earlier about the concern and, and computers and use of computers. And, and as you know, cyber attacks are becoming more prevalent. Uh, on the US side, there's an agency that actually develops the, the standards for cybersecurity. It's the National Institute of Standards and Technology. So there's where you can find some standards on a regulatory matter of how to uh, you know, develop your software and also develop the protection side uh, to prevent, hopefully prevent cyber attacks. Uh, another reference document. Uh, they do talk about the different, different types of bias that may, can creep in into software development. So it's, it's quite, uh, quite interesting uh, read, especially for you in academia, of uh, how you can approach, let's say, the development of the software as well as uh, prevention and uh, cyber attacks. Okay, and uh, just another reference, this one has particular, has been particular the special publication, security and privacy controls for information systems and organizations. Okay, uh, overview of cybersecurity, just to say that there is a, a, a framework core on how to approach that to identify, protect, detect, respond, and recover from cyber attacks. Um, I would note, though, that, that from a regulatory perspective and software uh, development, we have regulations for performance, but we don't have really the regulations to protect us in cyber attacks or, you know, how to protect the, the, the air traffic system or the airplane system. We don't really have good specific regulations that do that. So we have to rely on industry standards and agency standards like NIST to help us with those, uh, those concerns, security concerns. So if I'm wrapping up now, uh, talking about the public con uh, confidence. So when you get into the design and coupled with the testing, coupled with the uh, aircraft certification processes, and then we have to look at, it, especially for air commerce side of it, the registration of the aircraft, uh, air operator certification, the economic authority, they all come together. Um, there's uh, also a lot of interest in these days with uh, advanced mobility and drones and UAV uh, vehicles, RPAS. And this is how you, you, you develop that comp public confidence in order to, to, to help sway the, the public confidence part of it. And I'd like just to say it really involves a lot of safety management 
uh, involvement, as well as data and analytics, analytics and risk management, having clear standards to support the clear metrics in order to prove out these systems. So with that, that's the conclusion of my presentation. And now I'd like to, uh, print, to turn it over to our other co-presenter. And uh, Vicky Bungi, are you ready to go? Great, okay, Michael. Thanks good. for your presentation. Um, if you can have the slides up, I'm conscious of time, so I'll, I'll go through some of the aspects fairly quickly. My name is Vicky Bangu. I'm the regional president for Rolls-Royce based here in Singapore, covering our region of Southeast Asia, Pacific and South Korea. Um, I'm an engineer by background. I've done quite a bit of extensive um, research and, um, uh, and part of academia in my past, past history. But my current role is really about um, our activities within the region and how they contribute to the overall aerospace and land-based systems. Next slide, please. When I look at uh, describing Rolls-Royce, we are a global power group um, anchored in, in engineering and technology. So we call ourselves an industrial technology company. And our vision is about pioneering the power that matters, but it's really the purpose to ensure that the power that we connect users with, the power um, is there uh, available when it's needed with security in mind and protects our society. Next slide please. Our business um, is really in three part folds, civil defense and power systems. Um, and as you can see clearly from the huge amount of, of um, uh, the aircraft engines that we have, if you just look at the civil column, 35 different aircrafts are supported, um, more than 11,000 engines out in service. Similarly, a huge number of customers um, based globally with 16,000 engines around the world. So, so our activities have a tremendous impact um, on the world today and tomorrow. And we know that technology will play a fundamental role in enabling, especially our really focused journey and a transition to low carbon global economy. Uh, and it's about bringing technologies together, electrification, digitization, data and AI will play a huge and a tremendous amount um, uh, of efforts to get us on that journey. Next slide, please. Well, let me spend a bit of time just talking about how did um, AI come about in Rolls-Royce? And it's, um, it won't come as a surprise uh, if I say that we've been using machine learning, um, AI, advanced analytics since the 1980s. 1980s, when we were testing engines on test beds, taking measurements, doing the analytics, looking at engine health monitoring, these are some of the services that we started taking to our customers globally so that we could make informed decisions on the safety of our products, on the availability of our products. And technology from forefront has always been a key enabler for us in, in meeting and aligning with those incentives. And now it's the net zero that is driving in using the technology and ensuring that we bring innovation into the opportunities that are so demanding from a society. When I look at the scale of the challenge, we monitor 6,000 to 8,000 flights on an everyday basis. That's equivalent to 3,000 flights in the sky at any one point, at 3,000 engines in the sky. And if you look at the scale of what that actually means, we're analyzing every day more than five million data parameters and using all of this insight with an AI engine to ensure that we're making the right decisions and um, unlocking the right insights to our engineers so we can focus in the right places. And we've taken not just sort of a focus on the products, but it's also how does this um, link with some of the other um, uh, conversation that Michael was talking about, the risk management uh, and, and the whole value chain of activities. How do we ensure that it impacts positively into other supply chains as well? Next slide, please. So we do rely on data and analytics across the product lifecycle. Um, uh, and this means sort of the inventory that comes in, the, 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 the assembly lines, um, the, the assembly and test, the testing of the engines, and then taking the engines to our customers to ensure that we continue to drive the kind of um, 
uh, parameters that we that we're looking at safety fuel efficiencies of, of our engines but at the same time availability plays a key role so when when things need to be sort of um, quickly looked at the identifying root causes as quickly as possible becomes really critical and this is where we put a, a, a level of expertise and really focused expertise um, within our technology team and within um, our ecosystem here in Singapore with the Rolls-Royce um, at NTU Corporate Lab, where we decided to develop a, a what you see on your screen here, a smart discovery, which is using data science skills to unlock some of the analyticals analytics that we can use in our design making or decision making. So making the tool much more intuitive that really is the back engine and automate some of the, the heavy lifting that you might see associated with data science. We want to make this much more ready for everyone, not just sort of expertise um, uh, 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 of, of using AI to unlock the full potential. So really empowering our engineers. Next slide, please. Efficiency, consistency, objectivity are crucial to decision making. So we need a data rich environment with robust knowledge management processes to be able to codify, retrieve and discover capabilities. Um, so we constantly at Rolls-Royce drive a culture of capturing and documenting information. And some of the um, examples that where AI really stemmed for us, if you go on to the next slide, is in the design and the manufacturing of safety. At the heart of everything that we do is a really strong fundamental safety culture. And, and with the safety culture is a very strong element uh, of trust. And this is where trustworthiness really comes in. People have the right to expect that what AI is being used and how it is being used is ethical um, as, as we sort of start putting more of AI into our, our processes and into our tools. And it's not just Rolls-Royce people who need to trust the output of the AIs, it's the whole wider ecosystems, the regulators, the customers, the supply chain, together with the society and particularly this society. And from us, we believe that we've using at the forefront our strength, our safety mindset has been fundamental in putting some of the frameworks in place when it comes to uh, products and services uh, uh, in, in developing the AI tool sets. So a lot of um, robotic inspection takes place in our factories. And when we look at the efficacy of parts, we want to be able to automate some of those processes so that when you look at some of the decisions that are being made on that, it is as integral as the decision that you would make from a human with human um, uh, skills with a relatively strong experience. And this is where the sort of the, the, uh, the functionality um, and breakthroughs of the Alethea frameworks for us um, uh, came through uh, towards um, middle of last year. Next slide, please. And it is really important that we start going beyond theory here and really start using um, AI systems in a trustworthy and safe environment. We need to ensure that we keep our whole wider ecosystems and the public um, into a full step-by-step -step sort of visibility into why they can trust the decisions that we're making and the outputs that we're generating. And when we look at the Aletheia framework, the Aletheia is actually um, uh, named after the Greek goddess of trust and disclosure. Um, uh, and we felt that this was exactly why that, that trust is such an important part when we, if I take that robotic inspections into, into consideration as well, that we must be able to really understand the output um, um, that is being um, created from the AI and also be able to trust the output that's, that's being created. But it's not just um, robotic inspections. It could be the CVs um, that um, HR uh, processes might be sieving through. So th there's a huge amount of fairness, ethics, that, 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 that we've already started putting our Alethea framework towards. And it's done in a framework. And the framework is important to understand because it, it's looking at 
32 facets of um, societal impact that includes the governance, the trust, promoting the transparency, asking the questions in a way so that it makes the user really think about what is the input that's going in, how are we using AI, and what is the output coming out, and how will that be used? Um, and, and when we look at the AI, it's really ensuring at the output, we are mindful that we are detecting biases. Biases sit in data, they sit in us, they sit in individuals, and we must make sure that the, the, the biases are checked and the five-step continuous process tries to eliminate all of those biases in a consistent manner. Next slide, please. Our products are critical. They're mission critical. They travel at 550,000 miles per hour. That's what aircrafts do um, for in, in, in civil applications. And we continue to check and balance ourselves um, uh, and ensuring that the, the activities that we're working on are peer reviewed. Um, and we've also made the Elite framework um, open and accessible, which is free to download. And now we're looking to seek partnerships to develop that even further. Next slide, please. So when I look about bringing all of this together, the, the partnership becomes really critical here. So does collaboration. We're sharing our Lithia framework with the experts from UNESCO who are looking at um, uh, consulting with us on the AI ethics that sit behind the framework that we've created. We're collaborating across the geographies with National Hospital of Neuros Neurology and Neurosurgery in, in London to be able to make the right kind of decisions when it comes to identifying mutations. In Singapore, we have a core team that's looking at um, developing uh, our existing collaborations into our, from our ecosystems of ASTAR and NTU and the team that we have in Salita to be able to contribute to some of the AI um, uh, uh, outputs and the trust associated with that. So it's a global issue. No one company is going to solve the challenge itself. We have to continue to instill the strong digital safety culture. New technologies, capabilities are fundamental in driving the, um, the resilience towards a low carbon future, and we are ready for that. And for this, we need industries, governments, academias, regulators to all coexist and see how this potential of our net zero journey can be collectively unlocked. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you to both of our uh, presenters. They have raised a, a, an enormous amount to discuss and to examine in a short period of time. I was just thinking actually of using an example when we are looking for a common theme that binds both presentations. Both presentations were bound together pretty much by the issue of trust. And in the ethics framework, as we all know, uh, ethical principles in relation to AI usually require openness, explainability, transparency, accountability, these notions. So we have this idea that the customer, the passenger, whoever it might be, the user, uh, is fully aware and, and, and uh, has access to the information we need on which the decisions can be made that are, that are based on trust. But in reality, that's missing in most industries, and it's most probably missing in the aviation industry as well, uh, largely because of two things I, I'd raise, and, and I'd see how the presenters react to this. One is that many of the issues that relate to aviation safety are very complicated, very technical, uh, and somewhat removed from the experience of most passengers or users. So there's the issue of science. The second is that many users of the aviation um, uh, uh, industry, the aviation facility, do so on the basis of blind faith. Um, do you think... Michael and Vicky, do you think that when we're looking at the maintenance of trust, that it's important that the user, the passenger, the consumer of the service is more aware of what uh, trust can be based on? Or is it in fact something which we can never open up to the public sufficiently well? 
Thanks, Mark. I'm, I'm happy to have a first stab at that, um, and I'm sure Michael will comment as well. When, when it comes to um, engaging with the society, a, a lot of the, um, the sort of conversations around AI has been around, well, you've got to be an expert to understand AI, and your society is not an expert in AI. Um, and, and a lot of the focus that we've seen has been on to be able to trust AI, you need to see what it's doing. You need to open up exactly and understand where decisions are going, what's being computed, how it's being computed. Uh, and quite frankly, the technology is progressing at such a pace that we're not going to be able to keep up. So we've got to really look at it from a slightly different angle, which is how is AI being used? And how is the and, and, and the output of the AI, what decisions making will it be associated with? And really have more of a focus on is it doing that part right? Yeah, I think this is very important, the idea that uh, where AI is placed in the aviation experience needs to be more clearly understood in order that we can then have confidence and trust in the establishment of, of AI as a useful facility. Michael, what do you think? Well, uh, I'd like to pick up where you mentioned blind faith and, and the flying public. Uh, and that's important because, uh, you know, the flying public does have a certain level of blind faith because they're relying on, let's say, the regulators giving the seal of approval for the operations. But yet the regulators are not compelled or bound to give all information and make it all information transparent because you get into issues of proprietary information, but systems wide, I think so, but, uh, but there's a lot of information that's not actually available to the public. Therefore, it's that seal of approval, which is important for the public. Now, what does the public see? Uh, are things after the fact with regard to accidents and incidents? And that's what raises a lot of concerns. What happened? Why, uh, why, why did it happen? Is it going to be corrected? And that's what's really important uh, for public trust and confidence. You know? so, so those when you get into accidents and incidents, you do get into a deep dive on what happened. Hopefully, all systems are corrected uh, in order to maintain that uh, level of public uh, safety. Yeah, I'm just going to, going to raise, uh, yes, well, I was just going to say, and, and I think we need to um, communicate the successes of where AI is being used, not just sort of when AI goes wrong. Um, you know, um, Michael, you mentioned the design, the production, the airworthiness. There's a huge amount of successes we've seen in using AI in design in terms of improving the efficiency and the next generation of designs. Huge amount of efficiency gains in the production, a huge amount of um, uh, airworthiness sort of availability and the safety of our products. And we need to find that narrative that we can then communicate outwards that this is how that we are seeing some of the positives of the AI and have been doing for quite some number of years. Uh, rather than that's always that's perhaps it. one of the problems that in fact, it's usually just that one failure, that one accident, that one, I was thinking as you were talking there, Vicky, the situation with the MH370 and the fact that in some respects, the, the loss of that aircraft almost crippled that airline. Uh, and we're still in a situation now where we're not actually certain about what the, uh, the, the, the final determination of that flight was. Um, and it's an interesting issue too, because while on the one hand, when that plane disappeared, the first question was, was it pilot error? Then the second question was, was it machine error? And then the third thing was, we were hoping for the flight recorder, which is AI assisted. So the, the, the answer to the problem was going to come if we'd found the black box. And then in that, we would have been given some guarantees about what we could trust in the future or otherwise. Any if I may, I'd like to just kind of echo something Vicky said, because you know, I did talk about accidents when I, and Vicky's saying, yes, we need to be mindful of the positive nature of, uh, of AI technology. And it's true, but we're not really good at uh, giving out the, let's say the positive, uh, positiveness of aviation safety. Fact is, it's actually safer to fly in an airplane that is, than it is to drive to the airport to fly in the airplane. But the statistics are very factual, very real, but we're not really good at, at demonstrating 
for the public, the, let's say the positiveness of the, the, the safety aspect for an aviation. And it's really quite phenomenal because it is the safest, safest mode of transportation there is. Yeah, I think that's true. And I think also um, the Alicia or the Alethea framework, which uh, Vicky referred to, I think is very interesting too, because what Rolls-Royce has done is to say, look, don't just trust us because of the insignia on the back of our technician's shirt. Uh, you know, we were the greatest car uh, designer in the last hundred years, so you can trust us. Much more than that, I think what you're doing there is saying, well, look, have a look, have a read, have, have the openness comes at a very sort of street level. Um, was that the consciousness behind that framework? Was it, uh, you know, the idea that we've got to let the public know more than just say we're safe, but we're also ethical? That's the important point. Uh, for, for us, it started with the, the, the inspection example that I used. And what we realized when we were doing the inspection and how we were using the output was that we had to communicate across a, quite an array of our ecosystems um, from suppliers all the way through to the customers and airlines. Um, uh, so we, we knew that we were already starting to communicate outwards. And th th with the safety sort of um, mindset, we also realized that if it's helping us, it's very likely to help others as well. So we got together with some academics, pharmaceutical companies, automotive industries, and many others who actually are trying to solve the same problem. So rather than sort of um, boxing and, and badging it as Rolls-Royce, so for us it is about let's co-create and co-share. So we made the whole framework really open. It's open source. You can go down to the Lithium framework and you can download it today. It shows you how we put the sort of the, um, the five-step check-in process. It talks about the 32 facets that are really important in making sure that when you use AI, you can use in a trustworthy way. We're working with UNESCO that I mentioned earlier on. And that's and, and we welcome critique. It's really important to welcome critique because that's the only way we're going to collectively improve better and get better. If it's just one company or one source doing it, I think we're going to constrain ourselves. I think that's right too. And I think that answers the other part of the question about why is it different from the regulator's role? Because what you're doing is you're saying, look, we're putting up an ethical framework which shows you what drives our decisions. Not what we're told to do, but what we believe we should do. Um, I was just going to Michael, there was a question uh, put up that perhaps um, there would be a, a sort of a, a greater degree of trust uh, in the whole process of the airline industry if uh, the customer, the, the public, the general community was more involved in the design and development of the services they get uh, because often this is a very sort of paternalistic process uh, you know Boeing or whoever it might be says well this is good for you we're going to give you that and I was just thinking as, as I was reflecting on that question um, passengers might be comfortable with the, no the notion of an automatic pilot but they're not going to be comfortable with a robotic flight attendant uh, I'm just wondering whether that point that we need to bring the community in more when it comes to design is important. Well, and yes, and absolutely they can. And that may be one thing in terms of communication management that when you get into developing these standards, and I, I mentioned some of the alphabet groups, at RTCA, SAE, the community is invited. Even the, the panels on EASA and FAA, the community is invited to participate. Uh, to be part of, let's say, the design process. Uh, so, but, the, but there's a difference, though, in, ter in terms of what I mentioned earlier about the approval part of it, because there is some commercial proprietary information that cannot be given to the public for commercial reasons. But yet, absolutely, the community can participate in, let's say, in the forum for developing those standards. And perhaps that can be uh, emphasized better by the regulators as well as some of the alphabet groups. Yeah, I think. Yeah, thank you. And I, and I think one of the things that we are seeing is regulators and industries coming really close together on this. The, the, the net zero challenge that we have, the way technologies and electrification, we're going through the third era of aviation. It's going to look different. Our fuels are going to be different. Our propulsion systems are going to be different. Um, and it, we're all collectively sort of challenged with the same 
same obstacle, which is how do we get to net zero? Um, and one of the sort of really sort of um, positive developments I've seen is how regulators and industries are moving much closer to this space to really understand each other. So we are enablers to each other as opposed to barriers. I was going to raise this, and this comes out of something that Michael said in his presentation, the importance of coordination, the importance of engagement across the industry. And it's not just now engagement across the airline industry, but because of climate change and the sort of global concerns we now have about the sustainability of life, how do you both see something like climate change changing the priorities of using technology in the airline industry? So it's not just now about about profit or necessarily the, you know, the bottom line, but also a genuine concern to answer those criticisms that people raise about the fact that airlines are polluting and that the industry itself is fundamentally unethical. Uh, how do we respond to that? Yeah, I, I, and I think um, we've seen a fantastic um, change in the last 18 months um, where, um, you know, governments have got a plan and a roadmap in place that has been shared as an example in the UK and here in Singapore as well with the Green Plan. Um, our customers have also put together their sustainability strategies on their pathway on how they're going to get to net zero um, over a period of time and that journey. SIA have just released that last, last couple of weeks. We released ours. Um, a, um, a matter of four four weeks ago on our net zero carbon report. And it can't just be a vision. It has to be more than a vision in, in terms of how the whole industry is shifting, how capabilities within the industries are shifting, what are the types of technologies we're going to invest in, what is the near-term plan, what is the medium-term, and what is the sort of long-term plan, because it's no one single bullet. Um, and, and we're seeing governments, customers, industries, regulators, all talk in the same language. And that's been fantastic, which we haven't had before. Well, how do you see that, Michael? Well, uh, actually there are environmental standards in place now set by ICAO, which the regulators have to adopt, the environmental standards. Um, but, but the target dates may be what is in question because to you know, deal with climatic change and the environmental change and carbon offset, uh, those are important. So industry and, uh, and the regulators are working together, actually, to, to let's say, accelerate as fast as, can, as they can for those environmental concerns. The, the nice thing about AI is it helps improve the efficiency. When we look at approaches and, and so say, shaving time off and to be more efficient on approaches, well, that not only saves on the uh, carbon part of it, but it also uh, improves the noise part of it, because environmental concerns is not just the environment, but also noise and emissions, uh, which Rolls Royce is fully aware of as well. They do quite well at so so. But that's not perfect. There are target dates, and that's why we have to follow those target dates. I think you know sometimes the target dates may be five years out, maybe ten years out. I think ideally most people want it today. Yeah, and I suppose the target date issue is a political issue as much as a, a technical issue. Just one final thing, bearing in mind the time, I was just wondering whether. Uh, in terms of uh, ethical principles, uh, standards, certification, these sorts of things, I wonder sometimes, and certainly in the research we've done, whether all that discussion remains at the boardroom level or at the regulator level or at the level that never really seeps down to the people who are on the bottom of the pipeline, the people who are actually making the everyday grunt decisions about what we do, how we do it, and where we do it. And in some respects, we've talked to a lot of people at that level who say, look, we, we'd love to be ethical, but we just don't have the time. Our boss won't let us. We've got contracts that we have to meet. We've got you know, economic pressures. We're, too, we're little fish in the pond. Uh, how do we overcome that? How do we get the idea of the attribution of ethical decision-making right down to the people at the bottom level so they feel part of the process? You've got to change the culture in the organization. You've got to really, what does it mean being digital? What does it mean being digital savvy, being agile and using digital solutions? And how does it go into ethics and so on? It's a progressive journey. We started our digital culture journey seven years ago when our new strategic marketing group director came in place. And one of the things he said was, 
you know, we're still seen as a mechanical company at that time, but we're much more than that. We're, we're coupled with electrical systems. We're coupled with championing electrification and, and uh, celebrating and successfully using digital in all our products and services across the whole value chain. And really focusing on changing the culture and building it from ground up is how we started. And that's critical to um, any, any organization going through, the, through this journey. It, yes, you've got the board um, sort of uh, supporting, but that's exactly it, supporting, not yeah. doing it for you. It has to come, come from ground up. I'll go back to Michael to finish off. Just on that broad point of pushing it down the line, I reflect on a discussion I had some years back prior to COVID uh, with someone at the ticket desk who said to me, I can't make a decision like that. No one lets me make any decisions anymore. Uh, have we got to that stage where the only decisions that are taken are top end or by AI? Okay, well, uh, let me kind of paraphrase a little bit what Vicky was saying too. The safety culture and the just culture actually have to come together. And the communication is very important, whether it's up and down, left and right. It's the, the full interface where the employee on the ground or the technician and engineer on the ground fully understand you know, the decision making up above. And that kind of falls back on the, the board or the accountable manager to ensure that proper communication. Now, do we, we do have tools and processes with regard to risk management, risk register, but how far does that pervade down to the uh, employee down, to, uh, you know, doing the work? Yeah, maybe, maybe those uh, things could be looked at in terms of, an, uh, let's say, enhancing the safety culture and just culture of any given organization. I think that's right. And I think both of you have reflected just on that need. Uh, just to close, I would make an observation that I talked to a young AI designer in a very big tech company, the name of which I won't give you, who said to me, I just wish they'd open their ears. Uh, so that if someone would listen to what I'm doing, then they might learn something. And I think that that's an important uh, reflection to close on. I'll pass back to Weeman. Thank you, Mark, for the wonderful interaction with the speakers. You know that the whole content that we presented and the depth of the discussion only show that the whole topic on AI and ethics is, is something that is uh, so so deep that can that is best addressed through like whatever you all mentioned, collective means by having various regulators, corporates, government, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, come together so as to best benefit the industry or even the society as a whole. So that being said, uh, I'd like to represent SG Innovate to thank Mark again and also to all the attendees who have stayed with us till now. Also, a big thank you to Michael and Vicky for the great insights and discussion points shared. And back to the attendees, uh, do keep a lookout for our post-event mail, which will contain a recording of this session. And do reach out to us at, SG Inno at events at sginnovate.com if you'd like to connect with any of our speakers or simply just to have a chat with us for collaboration opportunities. Do remember to also give us your post-event feedback when you exit the webinar or through the post event mail as well. With that, this is Wei Min signing out from this webinar. Hope that everyone will have a great day ahead. Stay safe, stay healthy. Hope to have you again in our next webinar session. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.